This episode and all of our DroidCon NYC coverage is brought to you by Verimatrix Cybersecurity, protecting the applications that drive the digital economy. Learn more at VerimatrixCybersecurity.com. I'm sitting down here with Kevin Galligan, a Touch Lab partner at touchlab.co, Kotlin, GDE, all of the things. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm, I'm doing all right. <laughs> you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to talk with you a little bit about uh, kind of a little bit about your, your keynote, of course, which mm-hmm. is going to touch into this. But from a broader perspective, because I am personally not a developer, mm-hmm. but DroidCon really is kind of an institution at this point. And you were there from the very beginning, right? Oh, from the beginning of the North American portion of okay, the institution. All right. Yes. Fair. Okay. Fair. So like the last ten, you know, this is the tenth anniversary of DroidCon. Mm-hmm. You've I'm I'm assuming because you were there that long ago, you've probably been to a lot of these. I'm just kind of curious to tell for you to share your perspective on kind of the evolution of what's happened here in the last ten years. Okay, I mean, yeah, I, we, I've been to all the New Yorks for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, like, we quite literally ran the first mm-hmm. three, and uh, the first one, we've never run a conference. So the evolution has been uh, it's rather dramatic. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of, uh, I didn't know what to do the first year, a lot of DIY, a lot of nobody knew about it. We got a lot of people that were like, afterwards, like, oh, I heard about this. Like, darn, are you going to do another one? And I'm like, Maybe <laughs> like, like it was a lot, uh, and then you know the the next year was much more uh, professional as far as we we got brought some folks in and knew how to run conferences and yeah, um, and then the year after that was actually uh, the last year we ran it directly and then that one was really good. It was the only one we live streamed, which. Um, Whole other level of yeah complexity yeah 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 that was yeah. a whole different thing and then since then um it's really um you know like the way DroidCon works is, is it actually is uh it started as almost purely a franchise so if you wanted to run a conference you would talk to them and, and you know work out a deal and they would kind of help you get started with some resources and then you would run your own right so mm-hmm. and it's it's still that to some degree i would say especially the early days you, every conference would have their own like website that someone hacked together and everyone would have their own thing that they hacked together and attendance obviously and size would vary considerably that still happens i think but nowhere nowhere near as, it, as much as it used to like it would be a bunch of little cities and all these kinds of stuff and so now it has turned into whether there's really kind of four big ones you know, there's New York, San Francisco, London, and Berlin. Um, but DroidCon New York City itself has it's certainly evolved. It's, um, but it, it's always kind of had the same sort of core where it's, um, it, it, it's a mix of like, you know, we get a sort of advanced topics and deep dives and interesting mm-hmm. stuff. I've always trended towards like, I'd rather have something that's like kind of weird and interesting Rather than something that you could just go get the tutorial, yeah, you know, watch the YouTube video yeah, and, or whatever. And like we also run the meetup, and the meetup's a little different. Like you know, it might be like, hey, here's here's Recycler View or or whatever during whatever phase of time we were in the Android evolution, mm-hmm. and here it's more like, uh, you know, here's exactly what the bytecode looks like, or you know, again, just weird weird stuff. So it's kind of been that, and and it's always been pretty interesting. So yeah, right on. Well, you're talking a little bit about the evolution of Android, mm-hmm. and get from that same vantage point, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of the evolution of the conference itself, and I'm sure over that time, you know, lots changed in the realm of Android mm-hmm. and development. Like from that perspective, what if you had to wrap it up? How has the development perspective of Android changed in the 10 years that you've been involved in this from then to now? And are there some things that are just kind of the same old problems that we've been seeing or the, or we finally got solutions or? Well, that's an interesting question because there's sort of this expectation where you get to like, well, all right, we solved it. You know, like (laughs) we figured this out, you know, and and it's like, oh, wow. Okay. So it's, it it was MVP and it's, well, MVVM, I guess that's it, you know, Mm -hmm. and and it's like, that's not really how it works. I mean, I I was always amazed at like how the JavaScript world was kind of like, how are you still having these conferences and these, like, is, is it not just this thing, but like that keeps evolving. So I don't think there's a lot that's, 
I mean, I have to think about that a bit. But there's not a lot that's just like solved. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's sort of like things are it truly is. become, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's kind of the evolution of how people develop, you know, people develop things, right? You know, in the beginning, it's, it's all like sort of, you kind of have to write a lot of your own stuff and deal with a lot of your own problems and people figure out how to um, have good libraries and good tools and techniques to make that more, so you're not really figuring out that same thing mm -hmm. and you're kind of able to scale and do more, but then, then it's, 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 so you're doing more, but then you're, you're still solving that sort of problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and specifically with this kind of conference, and this is one of the things that I say, um, you know, nothing against industry sort of conferences where it's it's like the it's whoever is kind of the, making the technology will either give the talks or they'll have people in to give talks about the technology but uh it's often a talking about what kind of what they think you should do or you know maybe close to it but you're not really going outside the lines and the community events it's like it's okay to just be like you know i totally disagree with this thing so the actually the evolution of android development there was there, there were phases especially early on where you'd go to the docs and it would be like googlers saying okay here's what you do you know mm -hmm. and at that phase i mean even my i don't know why but my whole career is attached to sqlite at this point like uh, it, it was like, you should write a content provider and that's a separate thing and this is how you should do databases and then you write a special like string-based API and your app talks to that thing. And I, from the beginning, I'm like, why would you ever want to do that? Just call SQL. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's just this message that never quite got there. And a lot of the Google Docs were very official. And then the community has done a ton of stuff that's just like, no, do this and do that, and like, dissent, and here's this other library. And then there was this phase where you know, I would actually pin it to an exact time frame, around 2016, where the Android team was like, you know, we have to incorporate what the community is saying, we have to pay attention and do these things. Mm -hmm. And that really started to happen. Like, the official docs would talk about other stuff, and, and so the community conference did that. But as far as, like, have we got to a point where problems are solved? <laughs> there is no Are they ever thing. solved? Yeah, they're not solved. You know, they're not really yeah. solved. They, they, it's just that the solutions that now come out are, uh, it, they're not going to be, like, you know, going back anywhere near as worse as the other ones. It's just sure. some better idea. Or not better idea, but we try something, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of mm -hmm. how that goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, your, your keynote... Uh, of which you, you had a couple, so you're on the other side of that, so that's got to feel good at this yeah. point. But one of your keynotes was about the future of Android, the future of Kotlin, and, quote, everything. Right. That's a, that's a pretty large blanket there. Um, tell me where you see Android headed right now, if we're, if we're tying into that. Um, I mean, I thought, I thought about this a lot, endlessly. So, uh, and, and what I was saying in the keynote is that um, Android, I mean, you mean Android, the, the, the phone, you're not a developer, you mean Android development or Android Android? No, well, I think okay. in, you know, in relation to, to DroidCon, yeah, okay. I guess from a development standpoint, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and yeah, this is like, uh, pretty much all I think about or talk about all day, especially the last few weeks. So, um, the, the, what Android developer, and if you just, we're here in 2014, what Android developers were doing was you, you take kind of a survey, not a survey, but just talk to people. And especially that time, if you said, I'm a, a, doing a startup, that meant app. Like you almost didn't even have to say right. app because that was the, you know, the app craze time. Yes. And there was no like, should we, I, you'd occasionally hear like, hey, should we do this with PhoneGap? And it's like, well, that's going to be one heck of a startup. Like it was always like, do you know any mobile devs. Mm -hmm. Specifically at that time and a few years before it was like there's iOS and, and if they ever raise money they might do Android or something like that. Right. Which is kind of why we started an Android shop. It always seemed on, like it was attacked on. Nobody knew any Android maybe. devs except yeah. me and I was involved in like co-working spaces and I was like well I can, you can make a business out of this. So um, that was you know kind of that and now it is and what people really a lot of the folks do is, is they are Real hardcore Android, like the apps have become so critical to the businesses that are really need them, like mm -hmm. that class of business that um, they are, they're doing native app development. They're not doing anything that's that's outside of that. So it's Android development and the sophistication of these apps are so important that you know you you really have these scaled teams that are much larger. So that's a lot of what Android developers are doing. Like if you mm -hmm. went back to 2017, 
you know, you talk to someone at a large bank and it's like, what, you have five people on your app? Five, and then it's like they have 300 working on, you know, there's back end or server thing. That has changed. Like the sophistication of the Android development world has changed, mm. right? The, you know, the question I'm looking at is like, okay, so if you're back in this world of like, a startup now, like what are they doing? And you know, some will do native development, but a lot of them are just like, well, they do this thing. So it's it's kind of where what an Android developer winds up doing day to day as an actual professional Android developer seems to have trended towards working on large, sophisticated apps. But again, mobile is essential. Absolutely. I mean, for people and for businesses, especially the kinds of businesses that are building these kinds of things. So yeah. yeah have to be there yeah now you've been advocating uh since the beginning for kotlin multi-platform um i guess explain to me what that is first of all for those who, who don't know why it's so special and are you seeing the adoption of of that that you expect two big questions yeah yeah i don't know if you came to my second talk so uh, <laughs> um so it was interesting. I had a, it was explaining this to the founder of this guy who started Flutter yesterday. So, uh, <laughs> who was not very aware. It was an interesting conversation. Um, so, Kotlin multi platform essentially is um, it, it, it's, it, you can write Kotlin uh, sort of logic, and then for each platform that you're on, um, the Kotlin's common logic, as they call it, just doesn't have anything that's, uh, that would be platform specific, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, quick example, it's very straightforward, is you know, the, the Android Kotlin platform or JVM platform, you can also get in reference to a file, which is a Java OI, IO file, or you can, you, know, you can just grab a reference to something that's specific to Android. Like none of that exists. Sure in common, like threading doesn't exist in common because on platforms don't have threading. Right. But if you, you can write that common Kotlin and then essentially uh, have something that's gonna be defined eventually somewhere else, right? Um, and then that, that other thing gets represented in some abstract way in the common and then when it gets built, it just gets built for Android or gets built for iOS or it gets built for you know, whatever. Um, it, it's a way of have, having sort of common logic, but it is, um, it's not an all-in-one thing where it's like, okay, I'm gonna write a Kotlin multi-platform app. Like, it's, it's like, okay, I'm gonna write this piece of code and then you know, the iOS or, or Android, but li iOS is sort of easier to explain because it is sort of this different thing. It's like, well, I'll just call into these functions and then it'll do this thing and then it'll come back. Um, it is a way of just inserting other logic into, directly into the thing that you're doing. So it's like, if, an app is, you got a whole bunch of architecture and stuff that's happening here, and then also the UI that's happening here. Mm -hmm. Like some of this can be shared. That's essentially it. And, and the difference is it's not a framework where like, you know, again, like a Flutter or a React Native where you're essentially, the way it's designed is that you're going to be in this other world and make this whole other app. Mm -hmm. Kotlin's more like, well, you can make some of your thing and do, it, do another thing, which is philosophically how I, I see that that can be a way to homogenize some of your logic while not needing to also try to do everything. The idea being that underneath the platform specifics, Android and iOS are essentially sandbox containers. Sure. So there's this opportunity to say, well, yeah, you're not gonna do uh, permissions or camera or these other things the same way, but you certainly don't need to have a different math equate, like that kind right. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's the concept. That's why I, you know, I really got into it because, and some people are like, well, all the app's doing is calling a network and showing stuff on screen. I'm like, yeah, but if you go to an Android conference, how many things are about architecture? Like there is a lot of logic in a lot of apps. So there is certainly a debate for that. On adoption, um, that's, that's kind of the thing that I'm, I would say focus. Obsessed is a bit more of the word that would be accurate. <laughs> And it's partially because, you know, I look at it and, and if you could imagine some sort of AI that could actually write code, not, but whatever, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> That's um, a whole other yeah, yeah, like, like let's say wrote some it. super human, you know, actual intelligent AI that wrote a perfectly maximal KMP app. You would have a whole ton of code that would be shared and then specific parts that would be done. And if you right. looked at what that looked like the versus... The necessary parts. Yeah. And if you looked at what that looked like, 
written as separately, it would be like, wow, it's really obviously uh, a win. Mm -hmm. Like, it's technically possible. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, how to do that, like a small team, a couple of people with a small app can reasonably do that. And I, I have this chart in my talk where it's like, if you have a, a small team, a lot to code, and the bigger the team gets. So there are, uh, with exceptions, and I'm kind of looking at one now, but there are uh, a lot of larger apps that do have some KMP in them. And that used to be the metric, like who's using it? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, and they have a few modules and libraries. But if you look at the overall code that's in there, it's, it's like a blip, right? Mm. So my thing is like, okay, if this is going to be successful and, ado you know, and, and adopted, and if KMP, KMP's killer feature is native mobile, is, is that a big win or not? And I'm like, how do you scale that? And that's currently where I'm obsessed with. Like, why are bigger teams struggling to do this? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't say, is it, is it being adopted? Yes. Is it being adopted to the degree and the hey, scale you, that I think it should be? Yeah. It's a different question. Hey, you know what? Yeah. You got to start somewhere. And I think uh, I that don't, at the root of well, that is well, the awareness well, factor. Well, I, 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 job sure, but I would say, well, oh, can't be stable now. And, and like Google said, hey, you can use this. I'm like, all right, I'll start somewhere. I'm like, well, we got to figure yeah. this out soon because <laughs> because if it's like another couple of years and the yeah. story and, and inevitably and whether they should or not, when when people are figuring out what they should do, even if they don't work at a company that's remotely like the company they're listening to, it's just the larger microphone, the, the bigger names, it just generates more trust and, yeah. and sort of the people that are known in the community tend to be at some of these bigger companies. So when they get on stage and say, well, yeah, we looked at it, we used it a little bit, but you know, not really. The danger there is it becomes like yet another like well we tried that and it didn't work right you know right. what I mean and I'm trying to prevent that but also in my talk I have a slide with you know Moby Dick on there I'm like well you know maybe I'm just never maybe this male whale's never happening I don't know but you have to like <laughs> uh, you know you have to I don't know I'm like maybe I should cut bait but I just don't cut bait I've been doing this for like a long time so we'll yeah. see how it goes yeah fair enough fair yeah. enough well Kevin thank you so much for talking all about this and trying to condense. Your two talks down to a short podcast interview. I was but, uh, <laughs> like my first time through is like the, the the keynote and the other talk were well over an hour each, and I'm like, <laughs> well, we, yeah, we, yeah. we attempted so. to to touch on the highlights, and I cool. really appreciate your time. If people want to find uh, more about you or kind of follow your your you know sharings online about uh, Kotlin multi platform, where can they find you? Well, uh, yeah, Twitter, I'm there, but I feel like that's dead uh, in some ways. <laughs> as far as not about. Twi dead, it's not even called that anymore. But yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's not the same place, and um, you know. But obviously, the Kotlin Slack. Uh, ASG, but those are not really online. Uh, I hate to say it, but LinkedIn seems to be the place where people are talking the most now. Yeah. Uh, you can just go look at the Touch Lab blog. I, it was one of my things in the keynote, like where is everybody doing their chatting now? And I'm not even sure. Everywhere, yeah. that's the challenge. Touchlab.co. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right on. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate right. your time. Thank you.